Good morning to all of you, gentlemen. I feel a disadvantage here, um, born in New York, coming from Oklahoma. I have everything against me down here in Texas, but I do love Texas. I really do. I was at Fort Hood many before some of you were born, I think, but uh, uh, I, I do love it here, and I worked in Midland, Texas, and um, it's just been a delight to be brought down here. In my retirement, I do a lot of work with families, so I am happy to be here speaking to you gentlemen from the uh, Archdiocese of San Antonio. I'm so happy to be here on St. Joseph's Day. You know, this is uh, marvelous that uh, we should have this uh, get-together on St. Joseph's Day. And what a model for men. You know, that poor man, St. Joseph, he had it rough. Uh, you know, he didn't have it easy. From the day he met Mary, he had a tough time. You know, uh, there was Mary impregnated, and he didn't know what was going on. Imagine the frustrations that he had there. And then he um, has to go looking for a place for Mary to have the baby. Uh, and then he has to hightail it down to Egypt and work as an immigrant, an uh, immigrant worker. He certainly can identify with immigrant workers because that's what he was. And uh, the poor fellow, you know, it was day-to-day -day labor. If he got sick, he probably made nothing. So it wasn't easy for him. And there were no uh, you know, food stamps on the, in those days. And there was no social security. And he had it tough. And then he went back to Nazareth, worked as a carpenter, as a man would work with his hands. And he loved Mary, loved, his, loved the little baby, Jesus. And so his life wasn't an easy life at all. But he was a great model for married men. He was the leader of his family. You notice the angel uh, came to Joseph and uh, spoke to Joseph, not to Mary. And Joseph was the head of the family. So the angel didn't come to Mary, always came to the head. And St. Joseph, as I say, was a model. He taught our blessed Lord. He showed him the good example, and that's what this is all about. Men showing their children, their wives, uh, and being the spiritual leaders of their family. I think some men today have stopped being leaders, being in charge. The women I meet, now I'm, I'll be 50 years a priest uh, in June, so I've been around the block a couple of times, you know? Hey. Some people say, I thought you were 85 years a priest. And I was in the army when uh, George Washington went over to the Potomac. But um, as I say, uh, I've been around the block and I've met a lot of women. And I'll tell you, the women I'm meeting today want men. They're tired of these wimps. Yeah. I spoke the other night, I was at the Newman Club, you know, at the University of uh, Oklahoma City. And I said mass, and I had some of the university boys and girls there. And you know, you just can't believe the girl comes up to me and pretty much says, I can't find a man anymore. I can't find a man. I can't find someone I can trust. I can't find anyone. I want to have children. I want to have a family. <clears throat> I want a good man that I can count on. You know, women don't want to be in charge of the families. I find that women don't mind being submissive if they've got a good man. They rebel when they have a, a clown, you see. That's when they rebel, when they have a wimp and uh, when they're not respected. And women don't mind being submissive. Women uh, are lovers by nature. And women will respond to love. I find that women resent men who take advantage of them. But I, I believe sincerely that women are looking for good men, solid men that, um, and, and um, I'll talk about this in a minute because I'm gonna talk on a very sensitive subject in a couple of seconds. But um, the women I'm running into are not trying to take over the family. They want a man who is a leader, who's the spiritual priest of the family, and a man who really loves her and makes the family the center of his life. And that's your vocation, and that's how you're going to become a saint. I'm going to become a saint by being a good priest and putting up with the trials and tribulations of the ministry and the like, which are really nothing. But you men 
are in the most difficult vocation there is in the church. I'm convinced. You think the, 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 the nuns have a hard vocation? It's peaches and cream. <laughs> the priests never had it so good. We haven't got a worry in the world. It's you good people that have all the worries out there. Do you know what St. Francis de Sales one time said? He was a great saint. He said, the married vocation is the most difficult vocation in the world. And I'll bet you all agree with that. Yes, sir. Trying to please a woman. <laughs> and being concerned with earthly things, as St. Paul said in the, in the writings of the scriptures. It's not an easy thing. The anxieties that you have. Keeping a job, wondering whether you'll have a job this time next year, sending your kids to school, uh, taking care of, uh, worrying about your health, worrying about your wife's health. All these things are worries, anxieties, they're troubles. And St. Joseph had them too. And St. Joseph is a tremendous patron for you. Go to St. Joseph, ask him. He was a father, he was a husband. And ask him when you're down in the dumps. And many of you, perhaps all of you, have been married in the Catholic Church. You're all baptized. But you know the fact, when you went up and exchanged your vows at the altar with your wife, you married each other. The priest is only a witness to that. You are the ministers of that marriage sacrament. And when you said, I do to each other, God infu infused into your soul a special matrimonial grace. Just like he gave me when the bishop laid his hands on me 50 years ago, he gave me a priestly grace. And he gave you the matrimonial grace. And I would say, when you're down and depressed and things are not going well, stir up that grace. Stir it up and get it back into action. And God will give you the grace, as he did to St. Joseph in tough times. He'll give you the grace to get through the heartaches and troubles of your life. Have a deep devotion to St. Joseph. He knows what you're all about. You guys say, well, what do you know about married life, Father? Well, I tell you, I don't know anything about it. So you say, well, what are you doing up there? You know, it's easy for you to talk about all of this stuff, uh, chastity and purity. And, and uh, how can you tell us uh, not to contracept? and not to get sterilized, and, and to be chased, and to stay away from the internet and all this impurity. It's easy. You live in a dream world up there. Well, listen, I've gone to bed for 77 years alone. Now, why don't you try that? <laughs> so don't tell me I don't know. I feel your pain. <laughs> but it's, 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 you've got a difficult vocation, but you can become great saints. And that's how God ordained you to become a saint, by being a good husband, a loving husband, being the head of your family with love, and looking after your children and loving them. It's not making a lot of money, it's not uh, the big house or the great car, but it's how you lived your married life. That's how you're going to be judged, as I'm going to be judged by how I live my priestly life. And that's going to be the final thing. Not your money, your house, or your car. It's how you raised your children. It's how you treated your wife. Did you bring her closer to God, or did you drive her away? So your example and your Teaching, that's why it's so important that all of you know the teachings of the faith. Most of our Catholics today are ignoramuses. They don't know the faith at all. I think we've lost two generations of Catholics to the faith. And a lot of the blame is on us priests who don't teach anymore. We don't teach. And we have so many of our people ignorant of the faith. Well, you know what we're doing today? Just the opposite from what Jesus did. Remember in the Bible, Jesus taught the adults and he blessed the kids. We're spending all our time teaching the kids and blessing the adults. And no wonder we have a church full of dummies. You know, 
if our adults knew the faith and if we taught the adults the faith, then they would share it with their children. You know, if you've ever been to a child's baptism after the baby is baptized, there's a prayer over the father. May you be the best teachers of your children in the ways of the faith and the first teachers. In other words, you, the church prays that you will be the first teacher of your children in the ways of the faith and that you'll be the best teacher of your children in the ways of the faith. The church, the priest, we are secondary. You are the role. You are the ones who are the teachers, the apostles, the evangelists of your children. And this is an extremely important role that you have. And, you know, today we have 50% of our Catholic marriages breaking up. I don't know if you're aware of that. 50% of our Catholic marriages go down the tube. And I'd like to talk for a minute. We won't have very much time, We're, um, uh, which you're very happy. There's an old minister, a uh, Protestant minister in the army, I think he was, whatever, a Baptist preacher. Be, just before he got up to preach, he would say the prayer, Lord, fill my mind with worthwhile stuff, but nudge me when I've said enough. So... You guys nudge me, and you'll be looking at your watches like this, and then it'll be time to stop. I'd like to talk about chastity or purity. Now, sometimes people have to look this up in the dictionary, what chastity means. You know, get to go back. Oh, it's the control of the sexual desire. Okay, good. So that's important uh, that we always be chaste, whether we be priest, whether we be married, whether we be single. Chastity is a very, very important. That is the control of the sexual desires. Sex is wonderful, sex is great. If anyone doesn't appreciate a beautiful looking woman, uh, you know, there's something wrong with them. And if a woman doesn't recognize a handsome man, she's got some crossed wires. So there's nothing wrong with recognizing beauty. And sexuality is very good, it's marvelous. God instituted it. But like any good thing, it can be abused. You can abuse sexuality. Just like the beautiful soil that's up in North Dakota. The soil up there is dark and fertile. And you can put anything in that and it will grow. But if you take one speck and put it in your eye, you've got an infection. See, any good thing, when it's out of place, it causes problems. Sex is for married people. And it's exclusively for them and to be done the way God intended it to be done. The act of love where they become two in one flesh. But today in the married life, the single life, we have so much lack of chastity, lack of purity. It's dreadful. Now there were two great saints. Saint Alphonsus Liguori, he was a lawyer. And there was St. Jerome who translated the Bible. Those two saints said many years ago that nine out of ten people that go to hell, and by the way, hell still exists. You know, you may not have heard it in sermons over the last 50 years, but it is alive and well. You know, some people came up to Padre Pio, and they said, I don't believe in purgatory. And Padre Pio said, well, you will when you go there. Yeah, you'll believe it then, brother. This is very important. Nine out of ten people? Now, you don't have to believe that. But when you go there, maybe you can send me a message, okay? <laughs> Confirm it. Now, the Lord talked more about hell than he did about heaven. Read the scriptures. The Lord came down very heavy on people in the Bible. Last week, I think he said, you will die in your sin. You're liars. He didn't pussyfoot. You read the Bible, he wasn't one of these flaky people, you know. He came out straight. He told them like it was. We make, you know, the life of Jesus some kind of a mushy life. You read it, he didn't play games. Also at Fatima, I don't know if any of you have ever visited Fatima in Portugal, but those little children are said to have seen a vision of hell. And the little kid said, one of the girls said that we would have died 
on the spot when we saw the damned angels and the damned souls. We would have died if we were not protected by the Blessed Lady. And you know what Mary said to the little ones? More souls go to hell because of sins of the flesh than any other sin. So don't you think maybe once every 40 years we ought to talk about these issues, you know? It's not a question of, uh, I think one, some, one person said, it's not the first look that the sin is. It's not the first look. Because if you don't recognize beauty, you're weird, okay? Uh, it's not the first look. It's the second look that the sin is committed, you see. That's where the sin is, the gazing and the entertaining the thought and the desire. Ah, that's where it is. St. Augustine said, the roving eye is a messenger of an impure heart. The roving eye is a messenger of an impure heart. So it's important that we control our desires and we be very, very careful. And what we look at. I had an uncle, a priest in Buffalo, New York. And when I was ordained, I went up for the summer to help him. And I was, you know, a young priest, and I was saying, Uncle Pat, you know, asking him different questions, as a new priest would do. And uh, we got into sexual matters and sex and chastity. And I said, uh, Patrick, um, when does this desire to have sex go away? He said, Danny, three days after you're dead. <laughs> and then he said, you still have to put a pin in him to make sure he's dead. <laughs> so it's with us all the time, and it's a great desire, but it needs to be controlled, like the Clydesdale horses. In the, uh, the Ballantyne, uh, is it Ballantyne? Is it Budweiser or Ballantyne? Hey, where are you beer drinkers out there? Is it Budweiser? All right. And those clippity-clop, those horses go clippity-clop, those beautiful Clydesdale, and the coachman has the control, and they're beautiful. But if he loses control, those horses will pull you right over the cliff and kill you. It's the same with the sexual desire. It has to be under control. It has to be under the control of grace. And you can only control the sexual desire with the grace of God. The most you could go is a, is a month being chased without the grace of God. I'm convinced of that. Can't do it without God's grace. And all of you can do it. And one of the things, two of the things that are breaking up marriages today, since you're all married men, and a lot of times we don't hear anything in the pulpit on this, is this contraception and sterilization. It's the C word, you know, that you never hear. And it's this contraception that's doing terrible havoc on the marriages of our people today. And not a word from the pulpit. You never hear anything from the pulpit. It's a, it, it, it's a very rare situation that we priests ever open our mouths about it. I don't know why we think maybe that you can't live the Christian life, or maybe we priests think that you can't be chaste. I know that you can be chaste. I know that you can be great leaders of your family. But St. Joseph was a chaste man. And in order to be a leader, we must be chaste. Now, you know the teaching of the church on this, and it's not the teaching of the church. This is the sixth commandment. You must be chaste. I must be chaste according to my state in life. And we know that um, chastity in marriage is very important. And that act of love that God created in the Bible, he says, husband leaves, I believe, his wife, and he clings to her, and they become two in one flesh. Now, that beautiful act of love that a husband and wife engage in, I think it was John Paul II in the Theology of the Body, he said that that intimacy of married life is a form of worship to God. That's a worship of God, that form of life. It's not some four-lettered word. It's a, it's, it's a beautiful act of worship. And in that act of love that a husband and wife, and they come forward, they show their love for each other, they renew their marriage vows again, but also it's God's way of bringing new life into the world. And if we use a contraceptive, 
whether it be a chemical contraceptive or whether it be a physical barrier, we offend God deeply. And that is a serious offense against God to take that sacred act and split it down the middle using the unitive part of it and divorcing it from the procreative part. You see, to do that is highly offensive. And it breeds the abortion, you see, because abortions begin usually with failed contraceptives. So if you're going to destroy the abortion movement, we have to destroy the contraceptive mentality that's out there. And this is very, and you say, well, Father, what are we supposed to have? All the children in the world we, ha we can have? No. The church isn't saying that. There is a responsible parenthood. And there may be a sickness in the family. There may be a, a job problem. There may be this or that. There's no problem with spacing one's family, but the church has a beautiful medical model now called the natural method of family planning that a husband and wife can use and uh, they can space their families and at the same time show their love for each other. And as John Paul in his Theology of the Body, he compares the union of husband and wife to the Blessed Trinity. He says, as the father and the son love each other, so does the husband and wife. And as children come forth from that love, the Holy Spirit comes, proceeds. So the father and son love each other, and from that love comes, uh, proceeds the Holy Spirit. So there is an image there of the Blessed Trinity in the married act of love. And Jesus Christ in the scriptures, I think it's the book of the uh, letter to the Ephesians, Paul says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved his church. Wow. Jesus loves his church to the point that he gave every drop of his blood. And we are the fruit of that love of Christ for his church. When people contracept, they don't fulfill that image at all because they engage in something selfishly and there is no fruit of that love. So the image goes down the drain. So this is a very, I know a lot of times it's, it's a difficult teaching, but if you we're going to go to heaven, remember the Lord said, it's through a narrow gate. And it's over a rough road, and few there are that enter. You know, you have to give the whole gospel to the people, not just what their ears like to hear. And when we don't give you the whole gospel, we lie to you. And the greatest lies are told in silence. And so when we priests don't speak about these issues to you, we really lie to you. And when we don't help you to live these teachings by good natural methods of family planning and by good encouragement, we lie to you. Because what happens, you remain a spiritual dwarf. You're never going to grow up to the stature of Christ if you contracept or become uh, sterilized to prevent a child coming into the world. How can we grow up to the stature of Christ and become holy if we're breaking two very serious commandments by this? People who contracept are breaking the sixth commandment and people who sterilize themselves and have vasectomies and tubal ligations in order not to have a child. That is a serious violation of the fifth commandment. Say, so what's the fifth commandment? Thou shalt not kill. You say, what has that got to do with thou shalt not kill? A lot. There are many spin-offs on the fifth commandment. If I'm in the army and they're deadly on weight and I try to pass this weight exam and I'm about 10 pounds overweight, well, I think I'll chop off my leg and then I'll go on the scale and then I'll get on the weight. I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll pass the exam. You say, that's crazy, man. You don't have a right to take your leg off. Well, it's my body, isn't it? Yeah, I say, wait a minute. You know, those powers to bring new life into the world that God gave you and me, that gave to you men to use, those sacred powers, if you go in there and chop them up and destroy them, 
you're destroying a very sacred power. We don't have a right over our bodies to do anything we want. It's like if I'm going overseas for two years and I have a Mercedes Benz, and I go to my buddy and I say, I want to leave my Mercedes Benz here with you, uh, and I'll be back in two years. And you can use it and have fun with it and everything, but I'll be back, okay? So the minute I leave for overseas, this fellow takes the tires off the, the Mercedes Benz and uses it for an obstacle course for his kids in football. And he takes the headlamps off and he uses it for a salad bowls. And he takes the horn and he, he makes a doorbell with it. And then I come back two years later and I say, what? Is this what you've done to my car? I gave it to you for your use. It's not yours. Well, it's the same with our bodies. God has given these beautiful bodies to us to use them properly and not to misuse them. And when we go in there and destroy that sacred power that God has given to a man and woman to bring new life into the world, my goodness, don't we think and realize that these things are very, very serious matters and offend God deeply? Now, a lot of times, and I'm not judging any of you or blaming you or beating you up, the real culprit is us clergy that haven't opened our mouths about these issues and given you a heads up on this. Where are most of our people learning about the faith today? From CNN, from the TV Guide, from Newsweek and Time Magazine. That's where most of our people learn the faith. No wonder we have a church full of dummies. Now, that is why it's so important that we clergy spend quality time explaining the teachings of the church so that you're not resentful about it, but that you understand the meaning of marriage, what it's all about. I said that half of the marriages are breaking up today. That should put the willies in people. Catholic marriages. And I'll bet you that 98 to 99% to of the annulment cases that go to the archbishop are laced with contraception and sterilization. Laced with it. And they didn't receive much information when they got married, and they heard nothing from the pulpit in 40 years, and so their marriages go down the drain. You know, when you turn your wife into a chemistry set, and put her on these birth control patches and jams and jellies and IUDs and Depo-Provera and all of this stuff, for your pleasure, you turn your wife into a thing, and she resents it if she's a real woman. She's going to resent that. And then men say, well, my wife doesn't want to have relations anymore. My wife doesn't show any love. Well, no, because you're treating her like a stick or a stone. She's a human being, and she has feminine qualities. Oftentimes, the men go ahead, and they just want what they want, and they don't give a darn about the wife. And then they wonder why she goes cold and why she doesn't show any more affection, because she feels used and abused. And oftentimes, it leads to divorce. And if it's not a divorce, it's a standoff. I heard a psychologist years ago he said 98% of the married couples that go to bed today are not even talking to each other, 98%. You can't do these things. You can't go against nature and think you're going to be a happy person. If the company that made your car said you put the oil in here and the gas in there, you'd better do it that way because that's the way the company, the Ford, the Chevy, whatever, Honda, whatever it is, you better follow their instructions. And when God made us, and when we go ahead and we pervert the order of God, then we're going to pay a terrible, terrible price. And many women are so offended and so hurt because we go ahead and turn them into playthings and don't give a hoot about them. And then we wonder why we're not loved anymore. 
And that's the same with sterilization. I have a tape here, and I'll send it to you free of charge, the last of the big spenders, okay? Yeah. I'll take it out of my pension, your tax money. Hey, listen, this was done by a Navy pilot. He got fixed, you know, neutered, you know. He got neutered. He thought that was the chick thing to do, you know. So he went out, and he's a handsome-looking guy, and his wife looks like a movie actress. So he went out, thought it was cute, you know, almost blew his whole marriage apart. She started to put on weight, he put on weight, and the whole thing was starting to go down the drain. And they got it turned around, and the whole thing came back together again. By the way, in Oklahoma City, a doctor and myself, uh, the Edith Stein Foundation, we turned these things around, these vasectomies and tubal ligations at a very cut rate price. I got my card there, and uh, just in case some of you are interested in that. It's, uh, a lot of people want to do restitution. They know they've made a big mistake, and they want to restore the wholeness. They want to be whole again. Now, many times there's a good excuse for not doing it if you're sick or you don't have the money or whatever, but I would say most people can get it turned around. Those vasectomies and tubal ligations can probably all be turned around today, physically. Uh, most people have the money. They know where to get the money from. You got no money to get a car. You know where to get it when you need it. And most people are in pretty good health. So a lot of people get it turned around because they want to become whole. But sometimes you can't do that. But this little CD, she does it 20 minutes and speaks for 20 minutes. Um, the gentleman speaks for 20 minutes. He's a flyer. He's a, uh, in the and uh, I'm telling you, I, a bishop of uh, Jacksonville, Florida, Bishop Galleon, said this is the best thing he's ever heard on sterilization. You want to hear the consequences of sterilization? You need to listen up, put this in your car thing, and then send it off to your children if they're married so that they don't make the same mistakes. Let them listen to this. It's the best thing you'll ever listen to. And there's another thing on contraception by Janet Smith, there's another one called Contraception, Why Not? Excellent, about people who are thinking about using contraceptives instead of doing it God's way in the natural methods. Um, this is here too, but I, the yellow one is the contraceptive, or the sterilization, this is the other thing. We have to do things God's way and we have to be chaste. And another thing is, it's killing the spiritual life of our people. You can't live in the syndrome of mortal sin. Now, I say that many of you did these things, perhaps. You didn't know what you were doing. You hadn't heard it preached. You weren't sure. So you can't commit a mortal sin if you don't know. But let me tell you this. Back in the 40s, everyone was smoking their brains out. Eisenhower and Jimmy Cagney and all of the actors, they thought it was real chick until they found out that it was cancer forming. And I'm sure a lot of those people in the 40s and 50s that were smoking heavily died with cancer. God forgives, it's true, but nature never forgives. Nature never forgives. When you mess with nature, you play with contraception, you play with sterilization, you're playing against nature, and you're going to pay a price. And many times men don't know why they're paying this price. And women don't know because they're brainwashed by the culture we live in. We are living in a culture of death. And we Catholics, as your archbishop said, we should be Catholics first. Catholics should, who are doctors say, oh, well, I have to continue giving the pill out because I can't push my religion, I can't push my faith on my patients. Well, I say, doctor, that's a two-way street. Your patients should not be pushing their immorality on you. You should be a witness to Christ as a doctor, and you as a truck driver, a cab driver, a lawyer, whatever your profession is, you must witness Jesus Christ first. No wonder our church is going under. We have a church full of wimps. And we need to be men. A, wo a woman wants a man. She wants a man. And she wants to be part of him, but he must be a 
good man, a kindly man, a man who loves her and doesn't disrespect her. And a woman who feels loved will do anything for a man. And so you men have to stand up and be men and take command, take charge, and let's take the church back. And the last thing I want to say is I got two minutes, three minutes, two minutes, one minute, five minutes, five minutes. Okay. All right. You say, well, how do you become chaste? How can I be chaste? So listen up. Four things. Four things. And I'm out of here. You become chaste by not getting into the near occasions of sin. If you're going to mess around with the Internet and watch that filth, you're going to be a filthy person. And that's killing our men today, that Internet. They are watching this filth, and it's undermining their marriages, and it's a horrible thing, and the wife is offended and feels down. If you go to X-rated movies, watch filthy um, videos, hang around with guys that uh, tell dirty jokes all day, then you're going to be a dirty person. We must stop that and get away from that filth and ask God to protect us. The minute we see something, get away from it. Get away from it. Don't dwell on that stuff. The second thing is to go to confession on a regular basis. Try to go to confession on a monthly basis. God knows if we fall, he'll take us back. He loves us very much. Go to Holy Communion in the state of grace on a very regular basis. And have a deep devotion to the mother of the Lord. I keep a medal around my neck. It's called the... Um, one of them is the Miraculous Medal. And you men can get a beautiful a stainless steel medal, Miraculous Medal. And you have it blessed by a priest and put it around your neck and keep it there. And Mary will protect your chastity as she has protected mine. She'll protect yours. And you know what you could do for your wife? You could get her a beautiful gold chain and a lovely feminine medal, the Blessed Mother, small medal, and have a priest bless it and give it to her. And say, dear honey, wear this, and I'm going to wear mine, that we can be chaste, and we'll never do anything that offends the Lord, and that I may love you, and that I may always be yours. That's what it's all about, men, and you know that. And I'll, I said my Mass today for all of you. I said Mass specifically for you gentlemen that are here, that God will bless you and watch over you all the days of your life. God bless you, watch over you, and I know you'll say a little prayer for me. Bless you all. Thank you. There's a, just, uh, there's a nice